Good heavens, would you look at the time? Good morning, friends, it's Alexa again, and damn, even before Hype Week, we already are being blessed with news about Last Epoch, and there is 10 or technically 11 new bosses, the Nemesis system explained, new items we can actually see, there's so much to go over in this blog post, but first I wanted to show you the actual trailer, um, because there is a new trailer, so I'm going to show you the trailer, we just watch it together, and then we go into the blog post that pretty much explains what the trailer does. So let's make this great land a little bit smaller and put them in the edge down here. There you go, and then let's watch the trailer together. You remind me of him. Traveler, it's that same unwavering hope that led us straight into oblivion. And now, you're part of a war that you don't fully understand. I tried to warn you, to spare you, but his eyes are upon you now. There is no time left, no refuge, no hope. His harbingers are coming. Anyone else getting goosebumps with these? So there's a bunch of things we want to look all into later. There's a bunch of frames I wanted to still. Um, for example, this one is going to be the area where you will actually do a pinnacle boss. This is at the end of the monoliths, as it looks like. And there is an extra waypoint and shit and stash and all that. I mean, we knew that from screenshots. But still, it's interesting. Then, obviously, we had... Wait, where was it? This is interesting to see. Um, the Harbinger bosses will be in the same place as the existing bosses were, it seems. Um, so I guess I'm going to go with, but basically you will be fighting your regular bosses and then you will unlock the Harbinger bosses, which will, or Harbinger, that will be on there as well, apparently. There was a new area, I think. No, I mean, this is Raya, right? We know that. This is... Is that when you beat the last one, Elegas Pass Husk? Not sure if it's this one. Um, this is the Admiral Harton, right? Nothing crazy about that. I mean, the availability, we knew that. Nemesis system, gonna look at, that's interesting. But I read through all the thing already. What is this green stuff, by the way? Is that like, it's like a poison boss or something? That's interesting. It's actually a nemesis boss. So they apparently are also, they have different sort of effects like poison or something, I know. And that was pretty much it I wanted to show in the stills here, I think. Yeah, the pinnacle boss. Yeah, so let's look over the blog post, all right? So because there's a lot, <laughs> uh, it's going to take a bit. I'll try to make it as fast as possible. I've read through that yesterday already, so I know a bunch of things. Um, basically, they say here that they will now do bigger posts instead of, instead of daily smaller ones. So we have more to go over at once. Now, this evade is pretty much what we knew already. It's, I think, the same thing actually as in Diablo 4, when you hit spacebar. Except in Diablo 4, I believe it's iframes. So while you are rolling, you are Im immortal, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, immortal. <laughs> Immune to damage. Uh, not with this one. It's not really a dodge roll, as they say, because you do not evade anything. You still get damage. It's just a movement skill, all right? You just basically just move a few inches with your character to, to get out of shit. Um, but if you have dots on you or if you are in a huge AoE or in a boss attack, you still gain all damage. Also, we need some music while this runs in the background, obviously. 
That's a bit low, eh? So, um, yeah, it's not exactly the same thing. So, another thing was, you have two charges. You always have two charges on, well, always. You start with two charges, they have a four second cooldown. Um, each one, that is. And as your character level increases, so will evade cooldown recovery speed. So, as your character gains more powerful, you can also evade more often. So, you can jump around more often the further you level your character. Um, yeah, say here, it does not grant any immunity frames. It's really just to evade, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, the idea with this really was, from what I've gathered, they just wanted to, all classes to have some sort of mobility ability without having to skill into it. Um, and some classes don't have it anyway, right? Or some builds. Uh, I've run builds that don't have the evade ability, or like any sort of traversal skill. But it always feels a bit bad, especially because later in the game you want to go through things faster, you need some sort of movement skill, right? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. This can also be... There will be items that can work with this whole thing. They're also coming in 1.1 already. There will be items already. I think we can also see them here, yes. Um, yeah, assuming based on ability for all characters. I think this was also important for the bosses, I guess. Lowest level of possible mobility every player has. Yeah, split opportunities... Um, yeah, this is what I said. Feel forced to include traversal skill purely for evading incoming attacks. And now you have this thing. Even though, again, it's it's way shorter than like your usual teleport or whatever. So, um, and you don't, you're not Im immune like you are with some traversal skills. So it's not the same thing. Anyway, here are a bunch of the items. All right. Um, for example, shrine boots. Increase cooldown recovery speed for evade. This, for example, one of the things that will now be implicit. Then we have the flight of the Qu Quetzeri, whatever that... Quetzeri? Quetzeri? I don't know, I guess. Plus one evade charge. So basically you can evade three times. Very nice. Cooldown recovery for evade. Cooldown recovery speed for Fury Leap. So that's for the primal list. Haste after uh, evade and etc. So basically just faster. You know, so far, except for just straight movement speed, I haven't seen any use in Last Epoch for, for this kind of stuff, really. Um, like, putting this on, just using one item, like the boots, and only focusing on movement speed. Movement speed is sort of kind of a, a nice addition, usually, to your build. But it's, like, I haven't used it as the only thing I want to have in an item. So we'll see how this works out. I'd rather probably have some sort of... Um, resistances or even damage or something on my boots instead of just only movement but maybe there are builds that work with that right maybe you they added some passive skills that also work with this or they will over time so this was interesting because they also said here uh, some of these op options will even replace evade completely with a different mechanic such as double checks with the design team summoning a crab Carcinization, carcinization, I don't know, of momentum. Evade is replaced by summon crab. You have swiftness. Armor, minion armor, plus six to all attributes. Um, I don't know <laughs> what this is all about. You just summon a crab now on your evade. I guess it's sort of a minion build. <laughs> but for something is also funny, right? Because... And here I have actually have to have to talk a little shit on Mike and the design team of EHG because Mike said in one of his streams when I asked if there will ever be funny skins or microtransactions in the game like a spacesuit or I don't know some sort of crazy um, suit for your character or even like bikini suits or something like that. And they said they don't really want to have some sort of super crazy stuff in the game, right? They want to keep it, not like serious, but they want to keep it in a somewhat serious spot, I guess. And don't go into this crazy thing. And I already said at that point, dude, we have like B builds and Squirrel builds. Now we have Crab builds. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying. That's not quite what you said, but okay. Anyway, it's interesting though. So Evade can also be replaced with other stuff. So I'm sure there will be some, some crazy shit happening. Anyway, we made this cool. Um, I played Diablo 4 a lot in uh, recent times. 
I really got used to the um, evading out of shit with, with spacebar. So this is something the game really needed, I think. Now the nemesis. I cannot make this bigger for some reason. Can I... Um, video a new tab? Oh, I downloaded it. Nice. That's not what I want. Okay, feels bad. So I have to do it like this, huh? So yeah, we see this fancy thing. It's all a bit fast. Um, I think I cannot even stop it in the... There it is. So let's actually read over it so we know what they're talking about. Uh, let's, let's just explain it. Basically, um, this is a new random encounter system you will encounter during harbing, harbingers of ruin. Uh, that's basically just... This will be throughout the entire game. There will be these, much like the... Um, from the exiled mages, the prisons, this will have these these things over here, these ones. Where you can just interact with and then you can summon the nemesis to fight. There's a bunch of things so because you can choose here, as you can tell. Um, basically, they said the primary focus was around the pinnacle boss system, but... And this is a key thing, many players, and I think even most players, will not even get to the pinnacle boss. Because we know, we learned from the data, that... Most players did not even finish the very first monolith boss. That's in the data. Most casual players, which is like 70% of players, or even like 80, something like that crazy number, Mike said, they did not even finish the first monolith boss. And for the pinnacle boss, you will know later, you will have to go through all the monoliths twice and then get to the uh, pinnacle boss. So it's also going to be taking a lot to actually get there. Um, so yeah, very interesting. So this is here, so um, the people who don't even go to the Pinnacle Boss because they couldn't be bothered, or maybe they just don't care, or just don't have the time, they can still get some new shit with the Nemesis system. During both Campaign and Monolith of Fate, you may randomly come across this new encounter type, the Nemesis. These are powerful warriors slain by the Harbinger. So the idea, I think, is that these also are travelers like you from the past or from other time frames. And they were fighting against the Harbingers, but they failed. They were sl slain by the Harbinger. And now you can fight them. As sort of a time thingy, right? Basically, it's about loot, right? Uh, interacting with the Nemesis will present you with a window showing several items available from the Nemesis. As well as three options of what you would like to do in regards to the items. So, uh, yeah, you basically you see different, different versions of them. Some of them are like... Lightning and blood and poison, whatever, I guess. So this is the idea with it. So basically just new bosses, sort of mini bosses while you just play through the campaign. Pretty cool. It, this is similar to the events you have in Diablo 4, right? Not as diverse in what they do. It's basically just always one dude you fight. But basically it's just run through the um, campaign or through the maps and there is random encounters you can activate. That's pretty cool. So you have three, three options, right? You have Banish, Empower and Challenge. So it says here, banishing the nemesis will cause the encounter to be put to rest, banishing both the current nemesis and the items it offers. This will provide you the opportunity for a completely new selection of items with the next nemesis you find, without fighting him. Basically, if you open this and these are the other items you can get from him, right? And you see these and these all suck, you can just banish him and do another dude next time. Challenge. The second option you will be given is to challenge the nemesis. By selecting to challenge, the nemesis will rise from its grave to return to the fight. Should you succeed in getting the nemesis to rest, you will receive all of the items which were displayed in the earlier UI. If you defeat the nemesis, the next one you encounter will have a new set of items. So that's the idea. You do the challenge, that means you fight them and you will get all these items. When you beat them, okay? And then once you've done that, the next nemesis you find will have new items. And this is important because of the empower one. That's the interesting one. The final option will be provided with is the ability to empower the nemesis. By selecting Empower, the Nemesis will awaken and attack you in its rage. So basically, just you fight him again. But upon defeat, it will flee instead of dropping its items. You will encounter the same Nemesis again next time, which will have the same items available, but giving them potentially increased Ethics tiers, Fortune Potential, or Legendary Potential. That's a key thing. That's what I like a lot. So with this... Right, oh, let's read. Empowering a nemesis can also add new affixes to items, including non-experimental sealed affixes. Empowering... Oh yeah, including non-experimental sealed affixes. That's pretty cool. Empowering is able to upgrade sealed non-experimental affixes all the way to rank 6 and 7, which hasn't been possible before. 
That's actually kind of crazy. Yeah, it hasn't been. It's true, yeah. You could all always just seal that at a max you could be lucky with was tier 5, right? To seal a, an affix. Now they can go up to 6 or 7 when you empower them. So basically, you have, for example, this item, and it has 4 affixes on it, and it one sealed. And then you can empower it, and next time it could have a tier 7 sealed affix. However, this is, of course, random. Right? It might also just not have that or focus on other things. And then you actually need to find the next nemesis before you get there. So this getting like a tier 7 sealed non-experimental affix on your item will take a lot of time to actually make that happen, I feel like. Um, but I like it, especially the LP I like a lot. Because getting LP on items so far has been a real pain. So this is a cool, nice addition when you have this, this item. And it doesn't have LP on it, it just has one LP. You are you have a chance to get an extra LP on this item next time you fight the nemesis. However, I assume that this chance is gonna be very low. Just a guess, I don't know, but I guess it's gonna be very low. Uh, you can empower nemesis twice, increasing the quality of rewards as well as the power of nemesis holding them. So yeah, you can do it twice, and then you have to basically fight him. Um yes, that's obvious once you kill the one. Um it will start over as unempowered with new items. So one thing though is we saw here... No, where was it? It was here, right? Yeah. What is the replace thingy? I wish I could stop this. Oh, I can. Nice. So hold up. You can place in a unique item with no legendary potential or weaver's will. And then what? You will not get this item back until you challenge and defeat the nemesis. Empowering will not grant you the item back until you challenge it next time. You may be without this item for an extended period of time. So that's basically... Uh, where is it? No, hold up. Oh yeah, one of them you can replace apparently, okay? It doesn't say it in the text, that's interesting. You have one spot where you can actually put an item in yourself, I guess. That's cool. Yeah, so this gives you more possibilities to actually get the outcomes you want from your items. So let's say as he does there, he has this also a great way to choose the um, Calamity here. Because you want to have this item with more LP and this is so rare to get, right? So you can put it in here, then it's gone until you face the Nemesis again. And it can come back with more LP, for example. Or even better affixes. Or like, higher ones. Higher rolls. That is cool. You can only do it twice, though, per nemesis. So I guess we're gonna try to fight a lot of nemesis -sis -sis to get good items. I like the replace thingy because it gives you more possibilities to... It removes RNG a little, right? So you can actually work on getting some better items. This is really cool. I like the nemesis system a lot. It's very well done. Egg has to be forgotten. A relic. Unique stone egg. Can be replaced with a unique item that lacks both legendary potential and viewer's will. Change it into a random unique item if dropped or empowered. Oh, this is basically what you get here, right? This is what they showed here. Um, this one. So I guess... Oh, you have to... Is this random? It doesn't say it here anywhere, does it, right? Oh, there it is. Nemesis can also be found with a special reward type. An egg of the Forgotten. If you immediately challenge the nemesis, the egg will reward a random unique. However, you can instead replace it with your own unique item that has no legendary potential. I see. This item is then empowered through the nemesis system and can become a legendary by gaining random affixes. Oh, or instead even gain legendary potential. Okay, I see. So you can't always replace them. You have to be lucky to get the egg of the Forgotten. And then the nemesis can turn it into legendary with any affixes. But that's random. That's basically just the Weaver's Will. Like, they can, they can be shit, right? And can become... Or it can have legendary potential, which I assume is very low in chance. Or you drop it. Obviously, it says drop, right? If dropped or empowered, yeah. So if you just drop it down, then it becomes a random unique. That's not bad. It's, it's cool, right? Um, I hope these numbers are not complete shit. And I don't like the legendary thing, because that's just like Weaver's Will, that's just gonna give you shit you don't want, isn't it? 
Anyway, Harbingers and Forgotten Knight. And so we get into the titular system. Oh yeah, how's the Pinnacle Boss system coming to the... Uh, blah. History of Orinthia. Oh yeah, it's a, that's the Forgotten Knight in the end of time that always talks shit. I like her character a lot. As the past catches up with her, align yourself with the Forgotten Knight as a new faction. We knew this was coming, a new faction. As you progress through the new Harbinger system and eventually challenge the lead of the Harbingers. So that's the new skin of the Forgotten Knight. Now it's interesting. To gain access to the new Pinnacle Boss, you will first need to challenge and defeat the Harbingers. Right? You cannot just straight go to the Pinnacle Boss. There are new bosses which can be found deep within the Monolith of Fate. As you progress corruption different timelines, you will be able to encounter new Harbingers to progress your ranks within the Forgotten Knights faction and get closer to challenging the leader. Harbingers can be found in two main variants, Agile and Brute. Okay. Greatly different combat styles, gain abilities from the timeline's boss. Oh. You will need to defeat the Harbingers in each of the 10 timelines before being able to access the portal to the most difficult fight in last epoch to date. You also have a chance to harvest an eye from a Harbinger upon defeating them, which will use as a currency to access the Pinnacle boss fight. The first 10 unique Harbingers you defeat are guaranteed to provide an eye with a chance afterwards. This will provide you with 10 attempts at the Pinnacle fight when you first unlock it. Once you have defeated all 10 Harbingers, you can continue to challenge the Harbingers. But that's going to be on chance then. Okay, so you have 10 attempts to kill him. If you fail all of them, you gotta get these eyes back by ki killing more of the regular Harbingers. So this is actually really tough to even get there. Interesting. The Forgotten Knight. That's the new new Forgotten Knight lady. This is the new area also. After feeding the first Harbinger, you will begin your journey with the Forgotten Knights. It doesn't say when you actually get to them though. Right? So when do I actually kill the first Harbinger? I thought they after you killed all the bosses in the monoliths, all ten, you will then they will be replaced with the Harbingers, but apparently not. Shadow of Rowan, he will learn the Harbingers in Orange's history. Okay. We will set out on your quest to track down and end what which has caused her to all but lose hope completely. Okay. So this is the new faction, which is um usually exclusive, so you can be in the COF or the Merchants Guild and in the Forgotten Knights. And you gain benefits from it. These benefits include increasing Harbinger's unique drop chance, lucky blessing rolls, and even an increased chance to drop a new crafting material, the Glyph of Envy. Yeah, that's also new. We'll look at this later. So, uh, show me all controls, please. There we go. So, these are the 10 new bosses, right? Harbinger of Ash, Harbinger of Fear, Harbinger of Tyranny, etc. The interesting thing is required corruption over here, right? I don't know if you can see this. It says required corruption is 300. Corruption required for the next Harbinger encounter in one of the missing timelines. It says your highest corruption Harbinger kill, 275. Kills nine. So I guess you gotta get to like 300 corruption to kill the last one. And it says on here, which is currently... I can just make it like this. Yeah, my bad. Hold up, then... Um, I need to remove our land for a second. Aberoth. That's the new... I think this is pretty much the last... From what I've gathered so far, Aberov is the last one you will kill. This is the one that we saw there. This is the pinnacle boss. And to get to them, or to him, you have to kill all the other ones. The Harbingers gain the abilities from the monolith bosses. So the Harbinger of Destruction was probably going to have some sort of necrotic bomb like the Emperor of Corpses has. Interesting. I don't know how you get them though. It doesn't say how they are activated. It's interesting they went with corruption on this because Mike said they don't want to push corruption too high in the new 1.1. Anything above 300 is already somewhat crazy, he said. Then again, they also said that the Pinnacle system is designed to be the toughest bosses in the entire game intentionally. So they are hard intentionally. They shall be and they have to be. So, yeah. Interesting. I'm not entirely sure how this works. I guess corruption has to be increased with all of them. I hope. I really hope. Actually, I know because there is the glyph, right? I was going to say, I hope you can just sort of use the corruption I currently have in the Fall of Outcast, for example. And then the Stolen Lands also has this as its main corruption or base corruption. 
Because think about it, if you have to go to 300 in the last one and 250 in the second to last one, it's going to take forever to just get to corruption first. But there is a new glyph that apparently can uh, level up your corruption faster. So we'll look at this in a second. First, let's look here at the rewards. Glyph of Envy drop chance. 10% additional Glyph of Envy drop chance. This helps you with corruption. So we'll look at this in a second. Defeat unique harbingers and rank acquired corruption to unlock rewards. The tiers of sealed affixes added by empowering a nemesis are 15% higher on average. Oh, that's cool. 15% doesn't seem much though, but it's cool. This one was funny. I saw that on Rex's stream. Gaze of Orbis grants one additional corruption. One. Poggers, I guess. Blessings are lucky. Blessings roll their value twice and pick the highest value. This is pretty cool. Because blessings so far really have been a pain in the ass. Not only have do you have to fight the boss twice to even get or like the boss again to get a new or like to re-roll your blessing. With this, you roll it twice and you pick the highest one. That is very cool. Because it was so tough to get the blessing you want. How much your unique drop chance? Timeline harbingers are twice as likely to drop their specific uniques. That's cool. Okay, so this is all about corruption and blessings and bosses. So this is really the endgame faction, so to speak. Alright. Interesting. That was it? Oh no, Pinnacle Boss, there it is. With Harbinger's eyes in hand and all 10 Harbingers defeated, you can make your way to the portal beyond the Shadowed Road. Place an eye upon the altar and you will be pulled to the Harbinger's domain. Then we can find fight him, huh? With this domain, you will face off against the leader of the Harbingers and servant of Orobis, Aberoth. So we don't find Orobis again because I thought we would fight him, but apparently not. If I will take you through the four eras, with each presenting unique area mechanics and empowering Aberoth with new abilities to further crush your hopes. So this is a four-phase boss, apparently. I guess it's gonna take a bit to kill him. This area looks cool. This is definitely new. So the, the, he definitely has new, new areas to fight him. Aberoth will only be able to be challenged in the online. Yeah, we knew this. Yeah, it's online until... Um, the first person beats him, then he will be available anywhere else. Except it's uh, nobody killed him the first week, which I'm sure there will be someone. Although honestly, it's gonna take a bit, isn't it? Because you really have to level your character into the late game first, right? Then you have to run through all the monoliths first to kill all the bosses. Then you have to go through it again, by what I'm guessing, to kill the harbingers. Um, you gain bonus ability with that glyph, we'll look into it in a second, but still, to even get that, it's gonna take a while. Then you have to kill all these 10 bosses, and then the... then Aberoth. I feel like that's gonna take a while to get there. Also, your, your character pretty much has to be at least 90, I guess, um, to have enough power to kill him, because he's stronger than Tier 4 Jura, right? <coughs> yeah, we knew this. Um... I was actually gonna make a video about the death stream because Mike mentioned this on death stream. You may have not even known this, but there was a dynamic damage reduction on the bosses, meaning this was intended so you can't one-shot the bosses with an insane build. So basically they would gain a lot of damage reduction if you do damage too fast. If you didn't damage them for a while, it sort of would wear off. And nobody knew about the system really, it was hidden pretty much. They're going to remove that and i noticed this with um formosus a lot when i had like super crit builds and was killing everything easily and then i fight him it's just there's no damage whatsoever that feel felt very bad it was very annoying and they're uh, right it was a feels bad moment so now what's happening is they add ward to the bosses this damage reduction is removed but you have these points here you see these actually we gotta bring our land back it's happening you see these points, and anytime you cross one of these health-wise, they gain 75%. Oh no, it's not 75%, it's some sort of um, calculation. In ward, for this thing, then it goes back, then you do damage again to his health. Next thing, they gain ward again, etc. So basically, with each of these things, he gains ward, and then you kill the ward again first, and then health. So that's pretty much the idea, to not make... Like, you cannot one-shot a boss because he will gain the ward initially again. 
but it also there is no damage reduction you still keep your damage up your character doesn't feel less strong um, but the bosses are not as easy now personally i don't know why this is necessary what is wrong with one-shotting a boss if you have a super insane build mike said it's intended that the bosses are actually tough to kill so i guess you actually want to go through the mechanics of the boss and not just one-shot them but then again, if you actually found a super insane build, why not, right? If you are like me and you play suboptimal builds anyway, because you like fun builds over OP builds, then you won't one shot them anyway. And most people won't do that anyway. It's just uh, the crazy lads, right? Like you and me, who go into some crazy builds sometimes to try and one shot them. And I'm sure there's going to be one build or two, like it is right now, that can do it anyway because they are super powerful. I guess they can't do it anymore, but really just for that, I don't know if this was necessary. It's better than the, the former one with the damage reduction because that felt bad. I get this, but it's really necessary. I don't know. So that's pretty much just explaining what this is. Um, yes. Um, yeah, bosses also get 50% more resistance to stun and freeze. Uh, yeah, you can't... It increases the difficulty to, to CC lock them, right? Anyway, Cliff of Envy. A very common area of feedback we see is that it can feel very slow to progress through monoliths on subsequent characters. Yes. Key thing. Wait, what is this shit? Hold up. Um, yeah, there you go. This is something everyone has complained about so far. When you do an alternative character and you have like super crazy gear um, from like twin items, or even you just have a great build, you still have to go through all the monoliths unempowered once, which is boring as fuck because you kill everything easily. There is no challenge, but you also don't get good items. So that was just very annoying to go through this. So they are changing this. Uh, we didn't want players to simply skip monoliths as that can lead to a worse experience, especially for newer players. Uh, I don't know about that. Would you really think that new players just go straight to empowered monoliths? And even if they did, they just go back? I don't know. It's, uh, I feel like sometimes they're standing in their own way a little bit too much. Because what's wrong with just saying, okay, I have a super insane build. If you want, you can just go straight to Empowered Monoliths. But it's your decision. Right? And maybe even give them some sort of Nemesis fight before you even go there to see, okay, can you even do this? And if you die, then you can't. Right? If you play hardcore, you have to judge this for yourself anyway. Um, so, I don't know why this was necessary. Just give us Empower More Lives right away. I think this is unnecessary, personally. But whatever. Alongside tweaks to stability rates. This is interesting. It doesn't say what, but just tweaks. We're also introducing a new Glyph of Envy with patch 1.1. This item allows you to greatly accelerate progress through normal timelines you have not completed yet. Okay. And a large amount of stability to timelines you have completed. Okay, let's read. Destabilizes an item, unpredictably changing all properties other than the FX being upgraded. Okay? This ability is siphoned to the most recent monolith timeline you entered, greatly increasing its stability. Oh, okay. The fortune potential of the item is not changed beyond the normal reduction. Changes can result in affixes of buff tier 5. Okay. Seal cannot be changed. Grants far more stability if you have never completed the timeline before. Okay, so the idea is really, okay, what you do is, you have an item, any random item, you use the Glyph of Envy on any sort of its affixes. That affix is going to be upgraded, but all the other ones are completely changed, and all the implicits. Everything changes on the item, except the one you upgraded. And the most recent monolith timeline you entered, you get a huge stability buff. Okay? And this is, like, the, the stability bar on the top. So you can go through the monoliths way faster. You don't have to run through all the echoes. You can just pretty much go straight to the boss of that monolith. Somewhat. Um, and it grants far more if you have never completed the timeline before. So this is really focusing on the unempowered timelines to go through them fast. So this is really the only application for this glyph. Is for alternative characters to go through... The unempowered timeline is faster, so you get to the empowered ones. 
mean, you can also do this with empowered ones to go through to get to the um, bosses faster. So you can the bossing becomes faster later. But still, the application for that is very, very minimal. It's really only for alternative characters, right? And you have to find these. I guess they are somewhat rare. Yeah, but it's pretty much what it said. Um, having destabilized the item, the glyph siphons that lost stability and grants it to your most recently accessed timeline. The bottom of the fortune window will tell you which timeline will receive the stability. If it's a normal timeline and you have not already completed it, the glyph will grant the timeline full stability. Oh, okay. Okay, so you can basically you need 10 of these glyphs to go through the monolith, the unimpowered monolith super fast. Like it fills it up right away so you can go straight to the bosses and finish that monolith. You immediately conquer the quest objectives. Okay. If it's an empowered timeline or a normal timeline you have already completed, it will instead have a moderate burst of stability added. Okay. Glyphs of Envy can only be found within level 100 zones. Wait, level 100 starts at empowered monoliths. So this is absolutely fucking pointless for new characters in your cycle. Most commonly dropped from rare or harbingers. This helps to reduce negative user experience for new players feeling forced to use them and makes progression more even. Oh, I don't like this, gentlemen. I don't like this. Because that means the first time you will still have to go through all the unimpowered timelines fucking like before, annoying, boring, and slowly. This is only good in Legacy. Or if you have five characters already on your cycle and you have a bunch of Glyphs of Envy now, then you can do it. Mm, I don't like this. This should drop earlier. Not a fan of that. I mean, maybe it plays out differently when you actually play it. I don't know. I'm sure they tested it. But reading through it, it feels bad. This should happen way more often. Because what I want is the first character I play through the new cycle, right? Especially for me, who played a lot, and you, who played already a lot, has like 10 characters on Legacy or Cycle 1. You want to get to the Pinnacle boss fast with your super insane build, right? We set up already. Why would I have to play through the non empowered timelines dismally again? Because this whole thing is designed to not do that, isn't it? Nah, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. It also prevents interruption for community race events where a sudden glyph of envy could completely determine the race. And this is why I again said you shouldn't even have done that. You should just give us straight the empowered timelines. You come to the Forgotten Knight, you go to the monoliths, and you can choose right away if you want to do 100 corruption empowered. Why not? I don't understand why this is not a thing. Why would this not be whatever? Whatever, man. This video is already pretty long, but there we are. New items. Harbinger's Needle is a new item coming in Harbinger's of Ruin to further assist with pushing corruption. This item is very unique in that it's the first consumable equipped item. It's an idol, okay? Unique small Oribus idol. Breaks if equipped. Okay. When you kill a timeline boss above 90 corruption, causing the timeline boss kill to grant a free additional gaze of Oribus. Okay, but how often do these drop? Because that's just free gaze of dislike. I mean, you'd rather kill the boss of that timeline once more. That gives you like seven extra corruption, right? And you don't lose an item on it. It's not bad. It gives you free additional gaze, but like... I don't know. Seems not really that strong. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Quickly build large corruption boosts. If, like, if you kill five of them at once, I guess. But you lose inventory slots. Like, other slots. Hmm. I don't know. Anyway. This is crazy. 1.1 will be introducing 30 new unique items. 30 new uniques. Most of them will be able to be found through all the Terra. Those select few can only be found through the new bosses. We get to see four of them. Event Horizon. Isn't that a movie? Two-handed mace. 55% penetration against all resistances with melee damage. Finally, melee gets a buff. Dude. 
It's a melee item that actually does something. When you use a melee attack and hit at least one enemy, you gain a stack of delation. Up to 10. 50% more melee damage per stack of delation. Damn. Yeah, this is pretty much maxed all the time, isn't it? 5% less attack and cast speed per stack of delation. Oh, you have less attack and cast speed. <sighs> That's, mm, I don't know. Movement speed, also less. All stacks are lost when you lose evade. When you use evade. Why not just give me the fucking penetration on this item? Why does it have to have a drawback? Melee is already bad in last epoch. Just buff it already, come on. No, I don't know. Wall of nothing. That's cool. 12% chance to take zero damage when hit. Ooh. So you even have like a 12% chance to tank a fucking boss hit and take zero damage from it that would otherwise give you like 10,000 damage. That's cool. 76 ward DK threshold. That's not very much actually. Endurance threshold. 70% 70, 70 of endurance threshold added as ward DK threshold. Okay, ward per second. This is really strong, although it's like a 12% chance. I mean, it doesn't really do that much because it doesn't have a cooldown though. Oh, it does have no cooldown. That's good. Because I was thinking this might just um, negate a, I don't know, an easy attack from like a small spider right next to you, right? It does nothing anyway. But it has no cooldown, so it can happen all the time. That could be nice. I can see that being good. Can see that. Aberov's Command. Melee damage, spell damage. Void Cleave is now instant and is no longer a movement skill. Ooh. Void Cleave no longer has a weapon requirement. I don't know much about Void Cleave, but it sounds cool. I haven't never played that. Ravaging Aura is created by Void Cleave, lasts an additional 8 seconds and has 40% Void Penetration. Damage over time, area of area skills, Void Pen. That looks pretty strong. Face point. 140 dodge rating, 9% increased dodge rating, chance to gain dust crawl on dodge, black arrow on dodge, plus one bow void damage per dust crawl when using a black arrow. Free to dark quiver. So it's actually a void marksman happening. Interesting. So this one looks good. I don't know, we have to see how it actually plays out when you play it, but it looks good. This one also seems good for all the white cleave lands out here. This one. I hate that you lose attack speed, like 5% per stack, that means 50% less attack speed on 10 stacks. You get a lot of melee damage, but like, dude, there's no point in having a lot of melee damage if you don't actually, like, hit. I don't know, this seems kind of bad. We'll see. So we just see these four, there's 30 new ones, but yeah, interesting. For taking the time to, yeah, okay. So that was it. A lot of cool changes, I don't like the glyph. I don't like this. I think that should have just given us straight the empowered ones. Uh, the nemesis thing is really cool. I like this a lot. Pinnacle boss, is, uh, bosses look cool. Knights, this has some cool addition to the um, bossing, like all the endgame. Like basically, we got a lot of new endgame stuff, right? A lot of cool new endgame stuff now for the game. More uniques. And evade is cool. So generally, this is a very cool, very cool patch. Like, it's not even everything that is in there, right? We just got a glimpse of it. There's also lots of balance changes coming. And I think there's also more than they already announced. Pretty sure there's more coming. But this was already very cool. I like this a lot. The glyph thing is, is a minor setback, but uh, it's fine. It is fine. Anyway, tell me what you think of this. Are you super hyped for it? As I said, if, you, if I didn't mention it already, my bad. I will be streaming this game a lot on the 9th and the 10th and the 11th and the 12th. Um, lots of streams. You can get your Twitch drops on my Twitch streams, uh, Twitch stream as well. Make sure to tune in and let me know in the comments what you think of this. All the changes. Do you think something is stupid? Do you think it's absolutely insanely crazy good? Let me know below what you think of it and I will see you in the next video on stream.